to a world of mystery. Dan Pines. The tax collector. You found me. <laughs> Welcome to a world of mystery! Dan Pines? The tax collector! You found me! Thank you for the host, uh, Summer and Ready. I appreciate it. Much appreciated. And thanks for being here, everybody. Hmm. Hey, y'all. Good to see y'all, whoever's here. <laughs> um, I assume some are already are. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, tonight, we are finishing up book six of the Chronicles of Narnia, which means we only have one left after this, so good for us. Um, yeah. Last time, the the heroes that we knew uh, <laughs> from the book wound up finding the, the the silver chair that's talked about in the very title of the book, the silver chair. Real good, I know. Uh, <laughs> Finding out that it was a a chair that they used to restrain a prince that was bewitched 23 hours. I think it's 23 hours of a day. And the one hour a day that he's restrained, he kind of reverts back to his old self and has his memories back. And I think he was... Okie dokie. Uh, so I think he's been bewitched 23 hours a day for 10 years, I think they said it was. It might be shorter, might be longer. I don't remember exactly. Oh, no, it's no problem. Um, I was just going over a bit of a summary of what happened last time for people who missed it or forgot. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, that was, that was the big thing that happened last time. And they destroyed the silver chair, which was his restraint. <laughs> um, I have headphones on this time because I want to kind of hear the music that's playing. <laughs> um, and I gotta pay attention for something else, too. Um, in case something happens. Yeah. There we go. Thanks for being here. I hope that you enjoyed using your command, uh, Toria. Uh, I know you said you were driving home, so please get home safe. Um, and yeah, I might as well get started. 
with chapter 13. <laughs> Let's do this thing. <sighs> chapter the 13th. Underland without the queen. All the, oh, and I also, I believe, killed the queen, <laughs> who was a witch. Sounds good, Tori. I get home safe. Underland without the queen. Ready, if you want to play your music, do it now or forever hold your peace. I'll wait. So please, please do. Chapter the 13th, Underland Without the Queen. Just, you know what? <laughs> nah, never mind. Never mind. Never mind. Chapter the 13th, Underland Without the Queen. All felt that they had earned what Scrub called a breather. The witch had locked the door and told the Earthman, I hope the audio levels are okay, uh, the Earthman not to disturb her, so there was no danger of interruption from the present. Their first business was, of course, Puddle Glum's burnt foot, a couple of clean shirts from the prince's bedroom torn to strips, and well greased on the inside of, with butter and salad oil, off the supper table, made a fairly good dressing. With this, with the, when this had been applied, they all sat down and had a little refreshment, and discussed plans for escaping from the underworld. Thank you for telling me with the audio. Rillian explained that there was quite a lot of outlets by which one could get to the surface. He had been taken out through most of them at one time or another, but he had never gone out alone, only with the witch, and he had always reached these outlets by going in a ship across the sunless sea, what the Earthmen would say if he went what the Earthmen would say if he went down to the harbor without the witch, and with three strangers and simply ordered a ship, no one could guess. But most likely they would ask awkward questions. On the other hand, the new outlet the one for the invasion of the overworld, was on this side of the sea, and only a few miles away. The prince knew that it was nearly finished. Only a few feet of earth divided the diggings from the outer air. <clears throat> it was even possible that it had now been quite finished. Perhaps the witch had come back to tell him this and to start the attack. Even if it was not, they could probably dig themselves out by that route in a few hours, if they could only get there without being stopped. And if they only found the diggings un unguarded. But those were difficulties. If you ask me, began Puddle Glum when Scrub interrupted. I say, he asked, what's that noise? I've been wondering that for some time, said Jill. They all, in fact, had been hearing the noise, but it had begun and increased so gradually that they did not know <clears throat> they did not know when they had first noticed it. For a time, it had only been a vague disquiet, like gentle winds or traffic very far away. Then it swelled to a murmur like the sea. Then came running... Then came rumblings and rushings. Now there seemed to be voices as well, and also a steady roaring that was not voices. By the lion, said Prince William. It seems the sun then has found the tongue at last. He rose, walked to the window, and drew aside the curtains. The others crowded round him to look out. The very first thing they noticed was a great red glow. Its reflection made a red patch on the roof of the underworld, thousands of feet above them, so that they could see a rocky ceiling, which had perhaps been hidden in the darkness ever since the world was made. The glow itself came from the far side of the city, so, so that many buildings, grim and great, stood up blackly against it. But it also cast its light down many streets that ran from it toward the castle. And in those streets, something very strange was going on. The closely packed, silent crowds of Earthmen had vanished. Instead, there were figures darting about by ones, or twos, or threes. They behaved like people who did not want to be seen, <clears throat> that do not want to be seen, lurking in the shadow behind buttresses or in doorways, and then moving quickly across the open in flesh in fresh pla fresh places of hiding. Okay, I guess the music decided to throw in some Japanese dialogue, that's cool. But the strangest thing of all, to anyone who knew gnomes, was the noise. Shouts and cries came from all directions, but from the harbor there came a low rumbling roar which grew steadily louder and was already shaking the whole city. 
<clears throat> what's happened to the Earthmen? said Scrub. Is it them shouting? Tis hardly possible, said the prince. I never heard one of those rascals so much as speak with a loud voice in all the weary years of my bondage. Some new dovery, no doubt. And what is that red light over there? asked Jill. Is something on fire? If you ask me, said Puddleglum, I should say that was the central fires of the earth breaking out to make a new volcano. We'll be in the middle of it, I shouldn't wonder. Look at that ship, said Scrub. Why is it coming on so quickly? No one's rowing it. Look, look, said the prince. The ship is already far this side of the harbor. It is in the street. Look, all the ships are driving into the city. By my head, the sea is rising. The flood is upon us. As on be praised, the castle stands on high ground, but the water comes on grimly fast. Oh, what can be happening, cried Jill. Fire and water and all those people dodging about the streets. I'll tell you what it is, said Puddleglum. That witch has laid a train of magic spells so that whenever she was killed, at the same moment, her whole kingdom would fall to pieces. She's the sort that wouldn't so much mind dying herself if she knew that the chap who killed her was going to be burned or buried or drowned five minutes later. Hast hit it, friend Wiggle, said the prince. When our swords hacked off the witch's head, the stroke ended all the magic, her magic works, and now the deep lands are falling to pieces. We are looking on the end of the underworld. That's it, sir, said Puddleglum, unless it should happen to be the end of the whole world. But are we just going to stay here and wait? <gasps> gasped Jill. Not by my counsel, said the prince. I would save my horse, Coal Black, and the witch's snowflake, a noble beast and worthy of a better mistress, which are both stables in the courtyard. After that, let us make shift to get out to high ground and pray that we shall find an outlet. The horses can carry two each at need, and if we put them to it, they may outstrip the flood. Will your highness not put on armor? asked Puddleglum. I don't like the look of those. And he pointed down to the street. Everyone looked down, dozens of creatures, and now that they were close, they were obviously earthmen, were coming up upon from the direction of the harbor. But they were not moving like an aimless crowd. They behaved like modern soldiers in an attack, making rushes and taking cover, anxious not to be seen from the castle windows. I dare not see the inside of that armor again, said the prince. I rode in it as a movable dungeon, and it stinks of magic and slavery. But I will take the shield. He left the room and returned with a strange light in his eyes a moment later. Look, friends, he said, holding out the shield toward him. An hour ago it was black and without device, and now this. The shield had turned bright as silver, and on it, redder than blood or cherries, was the figure of a lion. Doubtless, said the prince, this signifies that Aslan will be our good lord, whether he means us to live or die, and all's for one for that. Now, by my counsel, we shall all kneel and kiss his likeness, and then all shake hands with hands one with another, as true friends that may shortly be parted, and then let us ascend into the city and take the adventure that has sent us. And they all did as the prince had said, but when Scrub shook hands with Jill, he said, So long, Jill. Sorry I've been on a funk and so ratty. I hope you get home safe. And Jill said, So long, Eustace. I'm sorry I've been such a pig. And this was the first time they'd ever used Christian names because one didn't do that at school. The prince unlocked the door, and they all went down the stairs, three of them with drawn swords and Jill with a drawn knife. The attendants had vanished, and the great room at the foot of the prince's stairs was empty. The gray, doleful lamps were still burning, and by the light, by their light, they had no difficulty in passing gallery after gallery and descending stairway after stairway. The noises from outside the castle were not so easily heard here as they had been in the room above. Inside the house, all was still as death and deserted. It was as they turned a corner into the great hall on the ground, ground floor, that they met their first Earthman, a fat, whitish creature with a very pig-like face, who was gobbling up all the remains of food on the tables. It squealed. The squeal was also very much like a pig's, and darted under a bench, whisking its long tail out of Puddleglum's reach in the nick of time. Then it rushed away through the far door, too quickly to be found. From the hall, they came out into the country in the courtyard. Jill, who had went to a riding school in the holidays, had just noticed the smell of a stable, a very nice, honest, homely smell it is to meet in a place like the Underland, when Hewson said, Great Scott, look at that. A magnificent rocket had risen from somewhere beyond the castle walls and broken into the green stars. Fireworks, said Jill in a puzzled voice. Yes, said Eustace, but you can't imagine those earth people letting them off for fun. It must be a signal. It means no good to us, I'll be bound, said Puddleglum. Friends, said the prince, when once a man is launched on such an adventure as this, he must bid farewell to hopes and fears. 
Otherwise, death or deliverance will both come too late and save his honor for and this re and his reason. Ho, oh, my beauties. He was now opening the stable door. Hey, cousins. Steady, Colback, softly now, Snowflake, you are not forgotten. The horses were both frightened by the strange lights and noises. Jill, who had been so cowardly about going through a black hole between one cave and another, went in without fear between the stamping and snorting beasts, beasts. And she and the prince had them settled and bridled in a few minutes. Very fine, they looked at their, as they looked as they came out in the courtyard, tossing their heads. Jill mounted Snowflake, and Puddleglum got up beside behind her. Eustace got up behind the prince on coal black. Then there was a great echo of hoofs. They ro they rode out of the main gateway into the street. <clears throat> Not much danger of being burnt. That's the bright side of it, observed Puddle Lum, pointing to their right. There, hardly a hundred yards away, lapping against the walls of the houses, was water. Courage, said the prince. The road goes there, down steep, steeply. That water had climbed only half up the greatest hills of the city. It might come so near in the first half hour and come no nearer in the next two. My fear is more of that. And he pointed with his sword to a great tall earthman with boar's dust, followed by six others of assorted shapes and sizes, who had just dashed out of a side street, and stuck to the shadow of the houses where no one could see them. The prince led them, aiming always in the direction of the glowing red light, but a little to the left of it. His plan was to get round the fire, if it was a fire, onto high ground, in hopes that they might find their way to new diggings. Unlike the other three, he seemed to be almost enjoying himself. He whistled as he rode, and sang snatches of an old song about Corn Thunderfist of Archenland. The truth is, he was so glad at being free from his long enchantment that all dangers seemed a game in comparison. But the rest found an eerie journey. <clears throat> uh, but the rest found it an eerie journey. Behind him was the sound of clashing and entangled ships, and the rumble of collapsing buildings. Overhead was a great patch of lurid light on the roof of the underworld. Ahead was a mysterious glow, which did not seem to grow any bigger. From the same direction came the continual hubbub of shouts, screams, catcalls, laughter, squeals, and bellowings, and fireworks of all sorts. Rose in the dark air. No one can guess what they meant. Near to them, the city was partly lit up by the red glow, and partly by a very different light of the dreary gnome lamps. But there were many places where neither of these lights fell, and those places were jet black. And in and, in and out of those places <clears throat> are the shapes of earthmen were darting... And in and out of those places, the shapes of earthmen were darting, darting and slipping all of the time, always with their eyes fixed on the travelers, always trying to keep out of the sights themselves. There were big and little faces, huge eyes like fish's eyes, and little eyes like bears. There were feathers and bristles, horns and tusks, noses like whipcord, and chins so long that they looked like beards. Every now and then, a group of them would get too big or come too near. Then the prince would brandish his sword and make, make a show of charging them, and the creatures with all manners of hootings, squeakings, and gluck, gluck, cluckings would dive away into the darkness. But then they had climbed many steep... But when they had climbed many st steep streets, and were far down, far away from the flood, and almost out of the town on the inland side, it began to be more serious. They were now close to a red glow, to the red glow, and nearly on level with it, though they could not see what it really was. But by its light, they could see their enemies more clearly. Hundreds, perhaps a few thousands, of gnomes were all moving toward it, but they were doing so in short rushes, and whenever they stopped, they turned and faced the travelers. If your highness asks me, said Puddleglum, I'd say those fellows were meaning to cut us off in front. That was my thought too, Puddleglum, said the prince, and we can never fight our way through so many. Hark you! Let us ride forth close by the edge of yonder house, and even as we reach it, do you slip off in its shadow. The lady and I will go forward a few paces. Some of those devils will follow us. I doubt not. They are thick behind us. Do you who have long arms take one alive, if you may, as it passes you at your ambush? We may get a true tale of it, or learn what it is is their quarrel against us. But won't the others all come rushing at us to rescue the one we catch? said Jill in a voice not so steady as she tried to make it. Then, madam, said the prince, you shall see us die fighting around you, and you must commend yourself to the lion. Now, good puddle glum? The marsh wiggle slipped off into the shadow as quickly as a cat. The others, for a sickening minute or so, went forward at a walk. Then suddenly from behind them there broke out a series of blood-curdling screams, mixed with the familiar voice of puddle glum saying, now then, don't cry out before you're hurt, or you will be hurt, see? Anyone would think it was a pig being killed. That was great hunting, exclaimed the prince, immediately turning coal black and coming back to the corner of the house. Eustace, he said, of your courtesy, take coal black's head. And then he dismounted, and all three gazed in silence while Puddleglum pull, pulled his catch out into the light. 
It was a most miserable little gnome, only about three feet long. It had a short sort of ridge, like a coxcomb, only hard, on the top of its head, little pink eyes, and a mouth and chin so large and round that its face looked like that of a pygmy hippopotamus. If they had not been in such a tight space, they would have burst into laughter at the sight of it. Now, Earthman, said the prince, standing over it and holding his sword point very near the prisoner's neck, speak up like an honest gnome, and you shall go free. Play the knave with us, and now you are a dead Earthman. Good puddle lum. How can it speak when you hold this mouth tight shut? No, then it can't bite either, said puddle lum. <clears throat> if I had the silly soft hands you humans have, saving your highness's reverence, I'd have been all over blood by now, yet even a marsh wiggle gets tired of being chewed. Sarah, said the prince to the gnome, one bite and you will die. Let its mouth open, puddle lum. Squealed the Earthman. Let me go. Let me go. It wasn't me. I didn't do it. Didn't do. Didn't do what? Asked Puddle Lum. Whatever your honor say, I did do. Answered the creatures. Tell me your name, said the prince, and what you Earthmen are all about today. Oh, please, your honors, kind gentlemen, whimpered the gnome. Promise you will not tell the Queen's Grace anything I say. <clears throat> the Queen's Grace, as you call her. The Queen's Grace, as you call her, said the prince sternly. Is dead. I killed her myself. What? cried the gnome, opening its ridiculous mouth wider and wider astonishment. Dead? The witch dead? By your honor's hand? It gave a huge sigh of relief and added, Why then, your honor is a friend. The prince withdrew his sword an inch or so. Puddleglum let the creature sit up. It looked round on four travelers with its twinkling red eyes, chuckled once or twice, and began. <laughs> End of chapter 13. Boom, baby. Cool. I did a little bit of catching up. Catching up. Hey, Summer, good to see you. Hey, Cupcakes, also good to see you. Hope you're enjoying your dinner, whatever you're having. I hope Brady's enjoying her dinner as well. Ten out of ten noises and claps for chapter 13. Good. Thank you. There we go. Didn't have a lot to catch up on, but this being such a late stream anyway, I didn't expect too many people to show up, so... <laughs> That's okay. Um, we can just move on. Move on! And it's still got another 40 pages to go. <laughs> About. So why not? <sighs> Sorry if my eating makes me nuts. Oh no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. I hope you're enjoying your meal. Chapter the 14th. The bottom of the world. Yes, enjoy your nom noms. My name is Gog, said the gnome. And I'll tell you, honors, all I know. About an hour ago, we were all going about our work. Her work, I should say. Sad and silent, same as we've done any other day for years and years. Then came a great crash and a bang. As soon as they heard it, everyone said to themselves, I haven't had a song or a dance or let off a squib in a long time. Why is that? And everyone thinks to himself, why, I must have been enchanted. And then everyone says to himself, I'm blessed if I know why I'm carrying this load, and I'm not going to carry it any farther. That's what, that's that. And down we all throw our sacks and bundles and tools. And then everyone turns and sees this great red glow over yonder, and everyone says to himself, what's that? And everyone answers himself and says, there's a crack or chasm split open and a nice warm glow, glow coming up through it from the really deep land, a thousand fathom under us. Great Scott, exclaimed Eustace. Are there other lands still lower down? Oh, yes, Your Honor, said Golg. Lovely places where we call the land of Bism. <laughs> Bism. This, <laughs> this country where we are, are, where we are now, the witch's country, is what we call the shallow lands. It's a good deal too near the surface to suit us. <laughs> you might almost as well be living outside on the surface itself. You see, we're all poor gnomes from Bism. 
whom the witch has called up here by magic to work for her. But we've forgotten all about it until the cr crash came and the spell broke. We didn't know who we were or where we belonged. We couldn't do anything or think anything except what she put into our heads. And with glum and gloomy things put, she put there all those years, I've nearly forgotten how to make a joke or dance a jig. But the moment the bang came and the chasm opened and the sea began rising, it all came back. And of course we all set off as quick as we could to get down the crack and home to our own place. And you can see them over there all letting off rockets and standing on their heads with joy. And I'll be very obliged to your honors if you'll soon let me go and join in. Bism. B-I-S-M. That's how I said it anyway. <laughs> I think this is simply splendid, said Jill. I'm so glad we freed the gnomes as well as ourselves when we cut off the witch's head. And I'm so glad they aren't really horrid and gloomy anymore. Then the print... <clears throat> Wait. And I'm so glad that they aren't really horrid and gloomy anymore than the prince really was. Well, what he seemed like. That's v that's all very well, Paul, said Puddleblum cautiously. But these gnomes didn't look to me like chaps who were just running away. It looked more like military formations, if you ask me. Do you look me in the face, Mr. Golg, and tell me you weren't preparing for battle? Well, of course we were, Your Honor, said Golg. You see, we didn't know the witch was dead. We thought she'd be watching from the castle. We've been trying to slip away without being seen, and that's when you four came out with the swords and horses, of course, everyone says to himself, here it comes, not knowing that his honor wasn't on the witch's side, and we all determined to fight like anything rather than give up the hope of going back to Bism. <sighs> I'll be sworn as an honest gnome, said the prince. Let go of it, friend Puddleglum. As for me, good gold, I have been enchanted like you and your fellows, and have but newly remembered myself. And now one question more. Do you know the way to the, the those new diggings by which the sorceress meant to lead out an army against Overland? Nee! squeaked Gold. Yes, I know that terrible road. I, I show you where it begins. But it's no matter of you to you, of use, Your Honor, asking me to go with you on it. I'll die rather. Why? said Eustace anxiously. What's so dreadful about it? Uh, too near the top, the outside said Gold, shuddering. <sighs> that was the worst thing that the witch did to us. We were going to be let out into the open and to the outside of the world. They say there's no roof at all there, only a horrible great emptiness called the sky. And the diggings had gone so far that a few strokes of the pick would bring you out to it. I didn't. I wouldn't dare go near them. Hurrah! Now you're talking, cried Eustace, and Jill said, But it's not horrid at all up there. We like it there. We live up there. I, I know you overlanders live there, said Gold. Uh, but, but but I thought it, it was because you couldn't find your way down inside. You can't really like it, crawling about like flies on top of the world. What what about us? What about showing us the road at once, said Puddleglum. In a good hour, cried the prince. The whole party set out. The prince remounted his charger, Puddleglum climbed up behind Jill, and Gold led the way. As he went, he kept shouting out the good news that the witch was dead, and that the four overlanders were not dangerous and those who heard him shouted it to others, so that in a few minutes the whole of the Underland was ringing with shouts and cheers, and gnomes by hundreds and thousands leaping, turning cartwheels, standing on their heads, playing leapfrog, and letting off huge crackers, <laughs> uh, came pressing round coal black and snowflake, and the prince had to tell the story of his own enchantment and deliverance at least ten times. In this way they came to the edge of the chasm. It was about a thousand feet long and perhaps two hundred wide, they dismounted from their horses and came to the edge and looked down into it. A strong heat smote up into their faces, mixed with a smell which was quite unlike any that they had ever smelled. It was rich, sharp, exciting, and made you sneeze. The depth of the chasm was so bright that at first it dazzled their eyes, and they could see nothing. When they got used to it, they thought that they could make out a river of fire, and on the banks of that river, what seemed to be fields and groves and unbearable hot brilliance, though they were dim compared with the river. There were blues, reds, greens, and whites all jumbled together. A very good stained glass window, with the tropical sun staring straight through it at a midday, might have something of the same effect. Down the rugged sides of the chasm, looking back like black like flies against all that fiery light, hundreds of earthmen were climbing. Your honors, said Gold Golg, and when they looked to when they turned to look at him, they could see nothing but blackness for a few minutes. Their eyes were so dazzled. Your honors, uh, why don't you come down the bism? You, you'd be happier, happier there than in that cold, unprotected, naked country on top. Or at least come down for a short visit. Jill took it for granted that none of the others would listen to such an idea for a moment. To her horror, she heard the prince saying, Truly, friend Gog, I have half a mind to come down with you, for this is a marvelous adventure, 
and it may be no mortal man has ever looked in abysm before, or will ever have the chance again. And I know not how, as the years pass, I shall bear to remember that it was once in my power to have probed the uttermost pit of the earth, and that I forbore. But what could what could a man live there? You do not swim in the fire river itself. Oh no, your honor, not we. It's only sal salamanders live in the fire itself. What kind of beast is your salamander? asked the prince. It's hard to tell their kind, your honor, said Gold, for they are too white hot to look at. But they're most like small dragons. They speak to us out of the fire. They are wonderfully clever with their tongues, very witty and eloquent. Jill glanced hastily at Eustace. She had felt sure that he would like the idea of sliding down that chasm, even less than she did. Her heart sank as she saw that his face was quite changed. He looked more like the prince than like the old scrub at Experiment House. For all this adventure and the days which he had sailed with King Caspian were coming back to him. <clears throat> Your, on, your Highness, he said, if my old friend Reepy Cheap Mouse was here, he would say we could not now refuse the adventures of Bism without a great impeachment to our honor. Down there, said Gold, I could show you real gold, real silver, real diamonds. Bosh, said Jill rudely, as if we didn't know that, we, that we're below the deepest mines even there. Yes, said Gold, I've heard those little scratches in the crust that you trap dwellers call mines, but that's where you get dead gold, dead silver, dead gems. Down in Bism, we have them alive and growing. There I'll pick you bunches of rubies that you can eat and squeeze you a cupful of diamond juice. You won't care much about the finger you won't you won't care much about fingering the cold dead treasures of your shallow minds after you have tasted the live ones in Bism. My father went to the world's end, said William thoughtfully. It would be a marvelous thing if his son went to the bottom of the world. <clears throat> if your highness wants to see your father while he's still alive, which I think he'd prefer, said Puddleglum, it's about time we were getting onto that road to the diggings. And I won't go down that hole. Whatever anyone says, added Jill. Well, if your honors are really set to go back to the overworld, said Gold, there is one bit of a road that's rather lower than this, and perhaps if that flood's still rising... Oh, do, 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 come on, begged Jill. I fear it must be so, said the prince with a deep sigh. <sighs> but I have left half of my heart in the land abysm. Please, begged Jill. Where is the road? asked Puddleglum. There, there are lamps all the way, said Gold. Your honor can see the beginning of the road on the far side of the chasm. How long will the lamps burn for? asked Puddleglum. At that moment, a hissing, scorching voice, like the voice of fire itself, they wondered afterward if it could have been a salamander, came whistling up out of the fairy depth of Bism. Quick, 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 to the cliffs, to the cliffs, to the cliffs, it said. The rift closes, it closes, it closes quick, quick. And at that same time, with ear-shattering cracks and creaks, the rocks moved. Already, while they looked, the chasm was narrower. For every side, belated gnomes were rushing into it. They could not wait to climb down the rocks. They flung themselves headlong, and either because so strong a blast of hot air was beaten up from the bottom, or for some other reason, they could be seen floating downward like leaves. Thicker and thicker they floated till their blackness almost blotted out their fire river and the groves of the live gems. Goodbye to your honors. I'm off, shouted Gold, and dived. Only a few only a few were left to follow him. The chasm was now no broader than a stream. Now it was narrow as they slit in the pillar box. Now it was only an intensely bright thread. Then, with a shock like a thousand goods train goods trains crashing into a thousand pair of buffers, the lips of rock closed. The hot maddening smell vanished. The travelers were alone in the underworld, which now looked far blacker than before. Pale, dim, and dreary, the lamps marked the direction of the road. Now, said Puddleglum. Uh, it's ten to one. We've already stayed too long, but we may as well make a try. Those lamps will give out in five minutes. I shouldn't wonder. They urged the horses to a canter and thundered along the dusky road in a fine style. But almost at once it began going downhill. They would have thought that Gulb had sent them the wrong way if they had not seen on the other side of the valley the lamps going out, <clears throat> going on and upward as far as the eye could reach. But at the bottom of the valley, the lamps shone on the moving water. Haste, cried the prince. They galloped down the slope. It would have been nasty enough at the bottom, even five minutes later, for the tide was running up the valley like a mill race. And if it had come to swimming, the horses could hardly have won over. But it was still only a foot or two deep. And though it swished terribly around the horse's legs, they reached the far side in safety. Then began the slow, weary march uphill. 
with nothing ahead to look at but the pale lamps which went up and up as far as the eye could reach. When they looked back, they could see the water spreading. All the hills of Underland were now islands, and it was only on those islands that the lamps remained. Every moment some distant light vanished, soon there would be total darkness everywhere, except on the road they were following, and even on the lower part of it, behind them. Though no lamps had yet gone out, the lamplight shone on water. Although they have good reason for hurrying, the horses could not go on forever without a rest. They halted, and in silence they could hear the lapping of water. I wonder if what's his name? Father Time fluttered out now, said Jill, and all those queer sleeping animals. I don't think we're as high as that, said Eustis. Don't you remember how we had to go downhill to catch, reach the sunless sea? I shouldn't think that the water had reached Father Time's cave yet. That's as may be, said Puddleglum. I'm more interested in the lamps on this road. Look a bit sickly, don't they? They always did. They always did, said Jill. Ah, said Puddleglum, but they're greener now. You don't mean to say you think they're going out, cried Eustace. <clears throat> Well, however they work, you can't expect them to last forever, you know, replied the Marsh Wiggle. But don't let your spirits down, Scrub. I've got my eye on the water, too, and I don't think it's rising so fast as it did. Small comfort, friend, said the prince. If we cannot find our way out, I cry you mercy all. I am to blame for my pride and fantasy which laid us by the mouth of the land of Bism. Now, let us ride on. During the hour or so that followed, Jill sometimes thought <clears throat> that Puddleglum was right about the lamps, and sometimes thought it was only her imagination running away with her. Meanwhile, the land was changing. The roof of Underland was so near that even by the dull light they could see it quite distinctly, and the great rugged walls of the Underland could be seen drawing closer on each side. The road, in fact, was leading them up into a steep tunnel. They began to pass picks and shovels and barrows and other signs that the diggers had recently been at work. If only they could be sure of getting out. All this was very cheering, but the thought of going on into a hole that would get narrower and narrower and harder to turn back in was very unpleasant. At last the roof was so low that Puddle Glum and the prince knocked their heads against it. The party dismounted and ow <laughs> and led their horses. The road was uneven here and one had to pick one step with some care. That was how Jill noticed the growing darkness. There was no doubt about it now. The faces of the others looked strange and ghastly in the green glow. Then all at once she couldn't help it. Jill gave a little scream. One light then the next one ahead went out altogether. The one behind them did the same. Then they were all in absolute darkness. Courage, friends, sang came Prince William's voice. Whether we live or die, Aslan will be our good lord. That's right, sir, said Puddleglum's voice. And you must always remember there's one good thing about being trapped down here. It'll save funeral expenses. Jill held her tongue. If you don't want other people to know how fat you are, this is always a right way to do it. It's your voice that gives you away. That was Jill holding her tongue. <clears throat> we might as well go on and stand here, said Eustace. And then, she, and when she heard the tremble in his voice, Jill knew how wise she had been not to trust her own. Puddleglum and Eustace went first with their arms stretched out in front of them, for fear of blundering into anything. Jill and the prince followed, leading their horses. I say, came Eustace's voice much later, are my eyes going queer? Is there a patch of light up there? Before anyone could answer him, Puddleglum called out, Stop, I'm up against the dead end. And it's earth, not rock. What are you saying, scrub? By the lion, said the prince. Eustace is right. There is a sort of... But it's not daylight, said Jill. It's only a cold blue sort of light. Better than nothing, though, said Eustace. Can we get up to it? It's not right overhead, said Puddleglum. It's above us, but it's th in this wall that I've run into. How could it be, Pole, if you got on my shoulders and saw whether you can get up to it? End of chapter 14. Yay! <laughs> chapter 14, right? Let off the squib, bism, fighting gnomes, gnomes. Now she's the gnome with Dobby the house elf. I sort of know that character. <laughs> I'm glad you got home safe, Victoria. Does the person want you in a room? I really hope it's an Artemis follow reference. I love that series. It was wonderful. Class for chapter 14. Also claps. Well, thank you for clapping.
listens. Hmm. Hmm. Weird. One second. Just one moment, please. Hmm, what's this do? Hmm, that's weird. do something I don't know why it's not doing anything it should do something wow that got me <laughs> usually I just can't hear it <laughs> I guessed right, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, I did heavily hint at something, <laughs> to be fair. Let me see something. See if this works. I don't have any room to turn around. <laughs> Good enough. For future reference, that's what that does. No room to turn around, so I couldn't turn around. <laughs> There's crap behind me. <laughs> Otherwise, I would have turned around, but I couldn't <laughs> without hurting myself, probably, or breaking things. <sighs> All right, um, oh, I'll put my water down here. Can we also get a Monica command? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> little bit of Monica in my life. A little bit of Monica by my side. Little bit of Monica is all I need. That'll do for right now. I don't have a Monica command. Because why use other names when you can just use Monica over and over again? And the Miasma Marshes clear up and I can travel through it at long last. Uh, let's see. I got about. I think 25 pages. Ooh, a little bit more than that. Don't died. Um, all right. <laughs> Maybe it's 16 chapters total. I'm curious. Because I can't wait. It is. It is that many. I'm going to drink a little bit more wah, 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 water. 
I'm glad so few people were here when that debacle happened. How to scare off viewers. That, uh, that is how you scare off viewers. Anyway, uh, chapter the 15th. The Disappearance of Chill. The patch of light did not show up any did not show up anything down in the darkness where they were still standing. The others could only hear, not see Jill's efforts to get onto the Marsh Wiggles back. That is, they heard him saying, You need to put your finger in my eye, and nor your foot in my mouth either, and that's more like it, and now I'll hold on to your legs. That'll that'll leave your arms free to study yourself against the earth. Then they looked up and soon they saw the black shape of Jill's head against the patch of light. Well, they all shouted out anxiously. It's a hole, called Jill's voice. I could get through it if I was a bit higher. Yeah. <laughs> that was my stone voice. Uh, anyway, what do you see through it? Asked Eustace. Nothing much yet, said Jill. I say, Puddle Glum, let go of my legs so that I can stand on your shoulders. Instead of sitting on them, I can study myself all right against the edge. They could hear her moving, and then much more of her came into sight against the grayness of the opening, in fact. All of her down to the waist. I say, began Jill, before suddenly broke off with a cry. Not a sharp cry. It sounded more as if her mouth had been muffled up, or had something pushed into it. <laughs> after, that, after that, she found her voice, and seemed to be shouting out as loud as she could, but they couldn't hear the words. Two things then happened at the same moment. The patch of light was completely blocked up for a second or so, and they heard both a scruffling struggling sound and the voice of the marsh wiggle gasping quick quick help hold on to her legs someone's pulling her there no here too late the opening and the cold light which filled it were now perfectly clear again jill had vanished jill jill they shouted frantically but there was no answer why the dickens couldn't you have held her feet said eustace i don't know scrub Grown puddle glum, born to be a mis, <clears throat> born to be a misfit. I shouldn't wonder. Faded, faded to be Pole's death, just as I was fated to eat talking stag at Harfang. Not that it isn't my own fault as well, of course. Uh, this, <laughs> this is the greatest shame and sorrow that could have fallen on, fallen on us," said the prince. "We have." We have sent the brave lady into the hands of the enemies and stayed behind in sa safety. Don't paint it too black, sir," said Puddleglum. "We're not very safe, except for death by starvation in this hole." I wonder, am I small enough to get through where Jill did?" said Eustace. What had really happened to Jill was this: as soon as she had got her head out of the hole, she found that she was looking down as if it was from an upstairs window, not up as if through a trap door. She had been so long in the dark that her eyes couldn't couldn't first take in what they were seeing. Except that she was not looking at the daylit, sunny world, which she also so wanted to see. The air seemed to be deadly cold, and the light was pale and blue. There was a good deal of noise going on, and a lot of white objects flying about in the air. I was at that moment. It was at that moment that she had shouted down the puddle glum to let her stand on his shoulders. When she had done this, she could see and hear a good deal better. The noises she had been hearing turned out to be two kinds the rhythmical thump of several feet, and the music of four fiddles, three flutes, and a drum. She also got her own position clear. She was looking out of a hole on a steep bank, which sloped down and reached a level about 14 feet below her. Everything was very white. A lot of people were moving about. Then she gasped. The people were trim little fawns and dryads with leaf-crowned hair <clears throat> floating behind him. For a second, they looked as if they were moving anyhow. Then she saw that they were really doing a dance, a dance with so many complicated steps and figures that it took you some time to understand it. It included slap, 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 and clap, clap, clap. <laughs> then it came over her like a thunder clap, 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 <laughs> that the pale blue light was moonlight and the white stuff on the ground was really snow. And of course, there were stars staring in the black frosty sky overhead and the tall black things behind the dancers were trees they had not only got out into the upper world at last, but they had come out in the heart of Narnia. Jill felt she could have fainted with delight. And the music, the wild music, intensely sweet and yet 
just a bit eerie too. Something about a little bit of Monica in my life. <laughs> and full of good magic as the witch's thrumming had been full of bad magic made her feel it all the more. This is kind of marked off like it faded so I'm trying to... Uh, all? All this... Yeah, all. It's three letters long. I don't know how to read. <laughs> all this takes a long time to tell, but of course it took a very short time to see. Jill turned almost at once to shout onto the others. Slap, slap, slap! <laughs> clap, clap, clap! I say, it's alright, we're out, and we're home. But the reason she never got any further than I say was this. Sucking round her and round the dancers was a ring of dwarfs, all dressed in their finest clothes, mostly scarlet with fur-lined hoods and golden tassels and big furry top boots. As they circled round, they were all diligently throwing snowballs. Those... Those were the white things that Jill had seen flying through the air. They weren't throwing them at the dancers, as silly boys might have been doing in England. They were throwing them through the dance, in such perfect time with the music, and with such perfect aim that if all the dancers were in exactly the right places at exactly the right moments, no one would be hit. This is called the Great Snow Dance, and it's done every year in Narnia on the first moonlit night, when there is snow on the ground. Of course, it's a kind of game as well, as well as a dance, because every now and then some dancer will be the least little bit wrong and get a snowball in the face, and then everyone laughs. What a jerk. But a good team of dancers, dwarfs, and musicians will keep it up for hours without a single hit. On fine nights, when the cold and drum taps and the hooting of the owls and the moonlight, they got into their wild woodland blood and made it even wilder. They will dance till daybreak. I wish you could have seen it for yourselves. What had stopped Jill when she got as far as to say if I say it was of course simply a fine big snowball that came sailing through the dance from a dwarf on the far side and got her fair and square in the mouth. She didn't at least mind. Twenty snowballs would not have dampened her, damped her, dampened her spirit at the moment. But however happy you are feeling, you can't talk with your mouth full of snow. And when after considerable sp spluttering, she could speak again. She quite forgotten her excitement. The others down in the dark behind her still didn't know the good news. She simply leaned as far out of the hole as she could and yelled to the dancers, Help, help! We've, we're buried in the hill. Come and dig us out. The Narnians, who had not even noticed a little hole in the hillside, were of course very surprised and looked about in several wrong, wrong directions before they found out where the voice was coming from. But when they caught sight of Jill, they all came running toward her. <clears throat> and as many as could scrambled up the bank, and a dozen or more hands were stretched out to help her. And Jill caught hold of them, and thus got out of the hole, and came slithering down the bank head first, and then picked herself up and said, Oh, do go and dig the others out. There are three others besides the horses, and one of them is Prince William. She, she was already in the middle of a crowd when she said this, for besides the dancers, all sorts of people who had been watching the dance, and whom she had not seen at first, came running up. Squirrels came out of the trees in showers, and so did owls. Hedgehogs came waddling as fast as their short legs would carry them. Bears and b -b 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 badgers followed at a slower pace. A great panther, twitching its tail in excitement, was the last to join the par party. But as soon as they understood what Jill was saying, they all became active. Pick and shovel, boys! Picks and shovels! All for our tools! said the dwarfs, and they washed, dashed away into the woods at top speed. Wake up some owls, they're the chaps for digging. They're quite as good as dwarfs, said a voice. What was she... What was that she said about Prince William? And said another. Hush, said the panther. The poor child's crazed, and no wonder about after being lost inside the hill. She doesn't know what the sh what she's saying. That's right, said an old bear. Why, she said Prince William was a horse. No, she didn't, said a squirrel, very pert. Yes, she did, said another squirrel, even perter. It's, it's quite true, don't, don't be silly, said Jill. She spoke like that because her teeth were not chattering with the cold. Immediately, one of the dryads flung around her a furry cloak, with which some dwarf had dropped when he reached to fetch his mining tools, and an ob obliging fawn trotted off among the trees to a place where Jill could see firelight in the mouth of a cave to, let, to get her a hot drink. But before it came, all the dwarfs reappeared with spades and pickaxes and charged at the hillside. Then Jill heard cries of, Hi, how are you doing? Put that sword down, and now young and none of that, and he's a vicious one now, isn't he? Jill hurried to the spot, and didn't know whether to laugh or cry when she saw Hustus's face, very pale and dirty, projecting from blackness of the hole, and Hustus's right hand brandishing a sword, with which he made lunges at anyone who came near him. For, of course, Hustus had been having a very different time from Jill during the last few minutes. He had heard Jill cry out and seen her disappear into the unknown. Like the prince in Puddleglum, he thought that some enemies had caught her, and from down below, he didn't see that the pile, pile, pale bluish light was moonlight. 
He thought the hole would lead up, lead only into some other cave, lit by some ghostly phosphorescence, ph phosphorescence and filled with goodness knows what evil creatures of the underworld, so that he had persuaded Puddleglum to give him a back, give him a back, and drawn his sword and poked out his head. He had only he had only really been doing a very brave thing. The others would have done first if they could, but the hole was too small for them to climb through. Eustace was a little bigger and a lot clumsier than Jill, so when he looked out, he bumped his head against the top of the hole and brought a small avalanche of snow down on his face. And so, when he could see again and saw a dozen figures coming at him as hard as they could run, it's not surprising he tried to ward them off. Stop, Eustace, stop, cried Jill. They're all friends, can't you see? We've come up in Narnia, everything's all right. Then Eustace did see, and apologized to the dwarfs, and the dwarfs did, said not to mention it. And dozens of thick, hairy, dwarfish hands helped him, helped him out just as they had helped Jill out a few minutes before. Then Jill scrambled up the bank and put her head in the dark opening and shouted the good news to the prisoners. As she turned away, she heard Puddleglum mutter, Ah, poor Pole. That's been too much for her this last bit. Turned her head. I shouldn't wonder. She's beginning to see things. Jill rejoined Eustace. <clears throat> and they shook one another by both hands and took in great deep breaths of free midnight air, and a warm cloak was brought for Eustace and hot drinks for both. When they were sip while they were sipping it, the dwarfs had already got all the snow and all the sods off a large strip of the hillside around the original hole, and the pickaxes and spades were now going as merrily as the feet of fawns and dryads had been going in the dance ten minutes before. Only ten minutes, yet already it felt to Jill and Eustace if their dangers in the dark and heat and general smother smotheriness of the earth must have been only a dream. Out here in the cold, with the moon and the huge stars overhead, Narnian stars are nearer than stars in our world, and with kind merry faces all around them, one couldn't quite believe in the Underland. Believe in Underland. Before they had finished their hot drinks, a dozen or so moles, newly waked and still very sleepy, and not very and not well pleased, had arrived. But as soon as they understood what it was all about, they joined in with a will. Even the fawns made themselves useful by carting around carting away the earth in little barrows. And the squirrels danced and leaped to and fro in great excitement, though Jill never found out exactly what <laughs> what they thought they were doing. The bears and owls contented themselves with giving advice and kept on asking the children if they wouldn't like to come into their cave. That that was where Jill had seen the firelight, and get warm and have supper. But the children couldn't bear to bear couldn't bear to go without seeing their friends set free. No one in our world could can work at a job of that sort of that sort as dwarves and talking moles were, work in Narnia. But then, of course, moles and dwarves don't look on it as work. They like digging. It was therefore not really long before they had opened a great black chasm on the hillside. And out from the blackness in the moonlight, <clears throat> this would have been rather dreadful if one hadn't known who they were, came first a long, leggy, steeple-hatted figure of the March Wiggle, and then, leading two great horses, William the Prince himself. As Puddleglum appeared, shouts broke out on every side. While it's a wig, why it's an old puddle glum, old puddle glum from Eastern Marshes. Whatever have you been doing, puddle glum? They've been search parties for you. The Lord Trumpkin has been putting up notices. There's a reward offered, but all this dry, died away, and in one moment, into dead silence. As quickly as the noise dies away in a rowdy dormitory, the headmaster opened the door. For now, they saw the prince. No one doubted for a moment who he was. There was plenty of beasts and dryads and dwarfs and fawns who remembered him from the days before his enchanting. There was. There were some old ones who <laughs> there were some old ones who could just remember how his father, King Caspian, had looked when he was a young man and saw the likeness, but I think they would have known him anyway. Pale though he was from long imprisonment in the deep lands, dressed in black, dusty, disheveled, and weary, they were there was something in his face and air which <clears throat> which no one could mistake. The look in his face of all true kings of Narnia who ruled by the will of Aslan and sit at Caer Paravel on the throne of Peter the High King. Instantly, every head was bared and every knee was bent. A moment later, such cheering and shouting, such jumps and reels of joy, such handshakings and kissings and embracings of everybody by everybody, else broke out that the tears came into Jill's eyes. Their quest had been worth all the pains it cost. Please it, your highness, said the oldest of the dwarfs. There is some attempt at a supper in the cave yonder, prepared against the ending of the snow dance. With a good will, father, said the prince, for never have any prince, knight, gentleman, or bear so good a stomach to his victuals as we four wanderers have tonight. The whole crowd began to move away through the tree toward the cave. Jill heard Puddleglum saying to those who pressed around him, No, no, 
My story can wait. Nothing worth talking about has happened to me. I want to hear the news. Don't try breaking it to me gently, for I'd rather have it all at once. Has the king been shipwrecked? Any forest fires? No wars on the Kalerman border? Or a few dragons? I shouldn't wonder. And all the creatures laughed aloud and said, Isn't that just like a marsh wiggle? The two children were nearly dropping with tiredness and hunger, but the warmth of the cave and the very sight of it, with the fright firelight dancing and the walls and dressers and cups and saucers and plates and on the smooth stone floor, just as if it does in a star farm, just just as it does in a farmhouse kitchen, revived them a little. All the all the same, they went fast asleep while supper was being got ready, and while they slept, Prince William was talking over the whole adventure with the older and wiser beasts and dwarves. And now they all saw what it meant, how a wicked witch, doubtless the same kind of white witch who had brought the great winter in Narnia long ago, had contrived the whole thing, first killing William's mother and enchanting William himself. And they saw how she had a, she had dug right under Narnia <clears throat> and was going to break out and rule it through William, and how he had never dreamed that the country of which she would make him king, king in name but really her slave, was his own country. And from the children's part of the story they saw how she was in league and friendship with the dangerous giants of Harfang, and the lesson went all... <clears throat> and the lesson of it all, your highness, said the oldest dwarf, that those northern witches always mean the same thing, but in every age they have a different plan for getting it. End of chapter 15. <sighs> boy. Oh boy. That was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for shouting out CJ. Hello, CJ. How you doing? Thanks for being here. Sorry it took me so long to acknowledge your presence, but I was reading. How to impress the viewers. 11 out of 10 stone voice. Well, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, man. And yes, thank you for shouting out CJ and Toria again. Stupid dog! You made me look bad! Yusuf's voice gets me every time. It is awesome. I rewatched it. Tara, what did it include? Slap, 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 slap. Did we do the command? I'm sorry I made Narnia weird and unusual and probably added too much nonsense. They probably the snowballs probably did dampen her face. Bad job, bad job, bad job, bad job. Mushroom, mushroom. I prefer smoothiness. It is a lovely smothering. Ooh, mother apple. Ample mother. Maple thermos. He just saw it, said it was weird and wanted to know what version of Narnia it was, and I felt like I was just ruining the entire series in one book. I did catch up. Good for me. We've got one more chapter, boys and boils and ghouls. Don't know why I referenced Tales from the Crypt, but I did. <laughs> and it's a doozy. I imagine based on nothing. <sighs> All right. Let's do this thing. Chapter the 16th. The Healing of Harms. When Jill woke next morning and found herself in a cave, she thought for one horrid moment that she was back in the underworld, but when she noticed that she was lying on a bed of heather, 
with a furry mantle over her, and saw a cheery fire crackling, as if newly lit, on a stone hearth, and farther off, morning sunlight coming in through the cave's mouth. She remembered all the happy truth. They had had a delightful supper, all crowded in that cave, <clears throat> in spite of being so sleepy before it was properly over. She had a vague impression of dwarves crowding around the fire with frying pans rather bigger than themselves, and the hissing and delicious smell of sausages, and more, and more, and more sausages. And not wretched sausages, half full of bread and soya bean either, but real meaty, spicy, fat, and piping hot, and burst, and just the tiniest bit burnt. And great mugs of frothy chocolate, and roast potatoes, and roast chestnuts, and baked apples with raisins stuck in, where the cores had been, and then ices, just to freshen you up after all the hot things. Joe sat up and looked around. Puddle Glum and Eustace were lying not far away, both fast asleep. Hi, you two! shouted Joe in a loud voice. Aren't you ever going to get up? Shoo, shoo, said a sleepy voice somewhere above her. Time to be settling down. Have a good snooze. Do, do. Don't make a to-do. Toohoo! My mistake. That should have been read like this. Shoo, shoo, said a sleepy voice somewhere above her. Time to get settling down. Have a good snooze. Do, do. Don't make a to-do. Toohoo! Why, I do believe, said Jill, glancing up at a white bundle of fluffy feathers, which was perched on top of a grandfather clock in one corner of the cave. I do believe it's Glen Feather. Choo, choo, Word the owl, lifting his head out from under his wing and opening one eye. I came up with a message from the prince at about two. The squirrels brought us the good news. Message for the prince has gone. Try to follow too. Good day. And the head disappeared again. As there seemed no further hope of getting getting any information from the owl, Jill got up and began looking around for any chance of a wash and some breakfast, but almost at once a little fawn came trotting into the cave with a sharp click-clack of his goaty hooves on the stone floor. Ah, you've woken up at last, daughter of Eve, he said. Perhaps you'd better wake the son of Adam. You've got to be off in a few minutes, and two centaurs have very kindly offered to let you ride on their backs down the care paravel, he added in a lower voice. Of course you realize it is a most special and unheard of honor to be allowed to ride a centaur. I don't know that I'd ever heard of anyone want doing it before. It wouldn't do to keep them waiting. Where's the prince? was the first question of Eustace and Puddleglum as soon as they had w waked. Okay, Toria, I hope you have a good night and pleasant dreams. Uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and yeah, I'm sure I'll catch you later. Uh... He, <clears throat> he's gone down to meet king, the king, his father, at Care Paravel, answered the fawn, whose name was Orens. His majesty's ship is expected in harbor at any moment. It seems the king met Aslan. I don't know whether it was a vision or face-to-face -face before he had sailed far, and Aslan had turned him back and told him he would find his long-lost son waiting for him when he reached Narnia. Eustace was now up, and he said Jill set about helping Orens to get the breakfast. Puddleglum was about was told to stay in bed. A centaur called Cloudbirth, a famous healer, or as Orans called it, a uh, leech, was coming to see his burnt foot. Ah, said Puddleglum in a tone almost of contentment. He'll, he'll, want to, he'll want to have the leg off at the knee, I shouldn't wonder. You see, if he doesn't, but he was quite glad to stay in bed. Breakfast was scrambled eggs and toast, and Eustace tackled it just as if he had not had a very large supper in the middle of the night. I say, son of Adam, said the fawn, looking with a certain awe at Eustace's mouthful. There's no need to hurry quite so dreadfully as that. I don't think the centaurs have quite finished their breakfast yet. Then they must have gotten up very late, said Eustace. I bet it's after ten o'clock. <laughs> oh no, said Orens. They got up before it was light. Then they must have waited to Dickens for a time, <laughs> over time for breakfast, said Eustace. No, they didn't, said Orens. They began to eat in the minute they awoke. Golly, said Eustace. Do they eat a very big breakfast? Why, well, son of Adam, don't you understand? A centaur has a man's stomach and a horse stomach, and of course both want breakfast. So first of all, he has a porridge of, and pavenders and kidneys and bacon and omelette and cold ham and toast and marmalade and coffee and beer. And after that, he attends to the horse part of himself by grazing for an hour or so and finishing up with a hot mash, some oats, and a bag of sugar. That's why it's such a serious thing to ask a centaur to stay for the weekend. A very serious thing indeed. At that moment, there was a sound of horse hoofs tapping on rock from the mouth of the cave. And the children looked up. The two centaurs, one with a black 
and one with a golden beard flowing over their magnificent bare chest, stood waiting for them, bending their heads a little so they, could, <clears throat> so as to look into the cave. Then the children became very polite and finished their breakfast very quickly. No one thinks a centaur funny when he sees it. They are solemn, majestic people, full of ancient wisdom, which they learn from the stars, not easily made, either merry or angry, but their anger is terrible as a tidal wave when it comes. Goodbye, dear Puddle Glum, said Jill, going over to the Marsh Wiggles bed. I'm sorry we called you a wet blanket. So am I, said Eustace. You've been the best friend in the world. I, I'm making it worse, CJ. <laughs> uh, and I do hope we'll meet again, added Jill. Not much not much chance of that, I should say, replied Puddle Glum. I don't reckon I'm very likely to see my old wigwam again either. And that prince, he's a nice chap. But do you think he's very strong? Constitution ruined with living underground, I shouldn't wonder. Looks the sort that might go off any day. Puglum, said Jill. You're a regular old humbug. You sound as doleful as a, at a funeral, and I believe you're perfectly happy. And you talk as if you were afraid of everything, when you're really as brave as... as a lion. Now, speaking of funerals, began Puddleglum, but Jill, who heard the centaurs tapping with their hooves behind her, surprised him very much by flinging her arms around his thin neck and kissing him, kissing his muddy-looking face, while Eustace did the same, wrung his hand. Then they both rushed away to the centaurs, and the Marsh Wiggle, sinking back on his bed, remarked to himself, Well, I wouldn't have dreamt of her doing that, even though I am a good-looking chap. To ride in a centaur is, no doubt, a great honor, and except Jill and Eustace, there is probably no one alive in the world who has done it. But it is very uncomfortable, for no one for no one who valued his life would suggest putting a saddle on a centaur, and riding bareback is no fun, especially if, like Eustace, you have never learned to ride at all. The centaurs were very polite, in a grave, gracious, grown-up kind of way, and as they cantered through the Narnian woods, they spoke, without turning their heads, telling the children about the properties of herbs and roots, the influences of the planets, the nine names of Aslan, which they with their meetings, and things of that sort. But however sore and jolted the two humans were, they would now give anything to have that journey over again, to see those glades and slopes sparkling with last night's snow, to be met by rabbits and squirrels and birds that wished you good morning, to breathe again the air of Narnia, and hear the voices of the Narnian trees. They came down to the river, flowing bright and blue in winter sunshine, far below the last, the last bridge, which is at the snug red-roofed little town of Baruna, and were ferried across on a flat barge by the ferryman, or rather by the fairy Wiggle, for it is Marsh Wiggles who do most of the watery and fishy kinds of work in Narnia, and when they had crossed they rode along the south bank of the river, and presently came to Care Paravel itself, and at the very moment of their arrival they saw the same bright ship which they had seen when they first set foot in Narnia, gliding up the river like a huge bird. All the court were once more assembled on the green between the castle and the quay to welcome King Caspian home again. Excuse me. Rillian, who had changed his black clothes and was now dressed in a scarlet cloak over silver mail, stood close to the water's edge, barehanded, <clears throat> bareheaded, to receive his father, and the dwarf Trumpkin sat beside him in his little donkey chair. The children saw there would be no chance of reaching the prince through all that crowd, and anyway, they now felt rather shy. So they asked the centaurs if they might go on sitting their backs a little longer, and thus see everything over the heads of the courtiers. And the centaurs said they might. A flourish of a flourish of civil tr silver trumpets came over the water from the ship's deck. The sailors threw a rope. Rats, talking rats, of course, and marsh wiggles made it fast ashore, and the ship was warped in. Musicians hidden somewhere in the crowd began to play solemn, triumphal music, and soon the king's galleon was alongside, and the rats ran the gangway on board her. Jill expected to see the old king come down, but there appeared to be some hitch. A lord with a pale face came ashore and knelt to the prince and the trumpkin. The three were talking with their heads close together for a few minutes, but no one could hear what they said. The music played on, and you could feel that everyone was becoming uneasy. Then four knights, carrying something and going very slowly, appeared on the deck. When they started to come down the gangway, you could see that what they were carrying. It was the old king on a bed, very pale and still. They set him down. The prince knelt beside him and embraced him. They could see King Caspian raising his hands and bless, to bless his son, and everyone cheered. But it was a half-hearted cheer, for they all felt like something was going wrong. <clears throat> then suddenly the king's head fell back upon his pillows. The musicians stopped, and there was a dead silence. The prince, kneeling by the king's bed, laid down his head upon it and wept. There were whisperings and goings to and fro. Then Jill noticed that all, of, all who wore hats, bonnets, helmets, or hoods were taking them off. 
Eustace included. There she heard a rustling and flapping noise above the castle. When she looked, she saw that the great banner with the golden lion on it was being brought down to half-mast, and after that, slowly, mercilessly, 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 with wailing strings and disconsolate bowing of horns, the music began again, this time a tune to break your heart. How could this happen to me? <laughs> they both slipped off their said dars, who took no notice of them. I wish I was at home, said Jill. Eustace nodded, saying nothing, and bit his lip. I have come, said a deep voice behind them. They turned and saw the lion himself, so bright and real and strong that everything else began at once to look pale and shadowy compared with him. And in less time than it takes to breathe, Jill forgot about the dead king of Narnia, and remembered only how she had made Eustace fall over the cliff, and how she had helped him to muff nearly all the signs, and about all the snappings and quarrelings, and she wanted to say, I'm sorry, but she could not speak. Then the lion drew them toward him with with his eyes, and bent down and touched their pale faces with his tongues, and said, Think of that no more. I will not always be scolding. You have done the work for which I sent you in the Narnia. Please, Aslan, said Jill. May we go home now? Yes, I have come to bring you home, said Aslan. Then he opened his mouth and blew. But this time he had no sense of flying through the air. Instead, it seemed that they remained still, and the wild breath of Aslan blew the way the ship, and the dead king, and the castle, and the snow, and the winter sky for all the things floated off into the air like wreaths of smoke. And suddenly they were standing in great brightness of midsummer sunshine on smooth turf among mighty, mighty trees and beside a fair, fresh stream. Then they, saw, then they saw that they were once more on the mountain of Aslan, high, above ground, high up above and beyond the end of the world in which Narnia lies. But the strange thing was that the funeral music for King Caspian still went on, though no one could tell where it came from. They were walking beside the stream, and the lion went before them, and he became so beautiful, and the music so despairing, that Jill did not know which of them it was that filled her ear eyes with tears. Then Aslan stopped, and the children looked into the stream, and there, on the golden gravel of the bed of the stream, lay King Caspian, dead, with the water flowing over him like liquid glass. His long white beard swayed, it, swayed in it like waterweed, and all three stood and wept. Even the lion wept, great lion tears, each tear more precious than the... Earth would be if it was a single solid diamond. <clears throat> and Jill noticed that Eustace looked neither like a child crying nor like a boy crying and wanting to hide it, but like a grown up crying. At last, at least that is the nearest she could get to it. <clears throat> but really, as she said, people don't seem to have any particular ages on that mountain. Son of Adam, said Aslan, go into that thicket and pluck the thorn that you will find there and bring it to me. Eustace obeyed. The thorn was a foot long and sharp as a rapier. Drive it into my paw, son of paw. Drive it into my paw, son of Adam, said Aslan, holding up his right forepaw and spreading out the great pad toward Eustace. Must I? said Eustace. Yes, said Aslan. Then he used to set his teeth and drove the thorn to the lion's pad, and there came out a great drop of blood, redder than all redness that you have ever seen or imagined, <clears throat> and it splashed into the stream over the dead body of the king. At the same moment, the doleful music stopped, and the dead king began to be changed. <clears throat> his white beard turned to gray and from gray to yellow and got shorter and vanished altogether and his sunken cheeks grew round and fresh and the, wink and the wrinkles were smooth and his eyes opened and his eyes and lips both laughed and suddenly he leaped up and stood before them a very young man or a boy but Jill couldn't say which because of people having no particular ages in Aslan's country even in this world of course it was it is the stupidest children who are the most childish and the stupidest grown-ups who are the most grown-up and he rushed to Aslan and flung his arms as far as he, they would go round and he, that, the huge neck. And he gave Aslan the strong kisses of a king. And Aslan gave him the wild kisses of a lion. At last, Caspian <clears throat> turned to the others. He gave a great laugh of his nice joys. <laughs> Why, Eustace, he said. Eustace, so you did reach the end of the world after all. What about my second best sword that you broke on the sea serpent? Eustace made a step forward toward him with both hands held out and then drew back with a startled expression. L look here, he said. I say, he stammered. It, it, it's, it's all v very well, but aren't you? I mean, didn't you? Oh, don't be such an ass, said Caspian. But, Eustace said, looking at Aslan, hasn't he uh, died? Yes, said the lion in a very quiet voice. Yes, said the lion in a very quiet voice. Almost. Jill as thought as if he was laughing. He has died. Most people have, you know. Even I have. There are very few who haven't. Oh, said Caspian, I see what's bothering you. 
You think I'm a ghost or some nonsense, but don't you see? I would be that if I appeared in Narnia, now, because I don't belong there anymore. But one can't be a ghost in one's own country. I might be a ghost if I got into your world. I don't know, but I suppose it isn't yours either. Now you're here. A great hope rose in the children's hearts, but Aslan shook his shaggy head. No, my dears, he said. When you meet me here again, you will have come to stay. But not now. You must go back to your own world for a while. Sir, said Caspian, I've always wanted to have just one glimpse of their world. Is that wrong? You cannot, you cannot want wrong things anymore, now that you have died, my son, said Aslan. And you shall see the world for five minutes of their time. It will take no longer for you to set things right there. Then Aslan explained to Caspian what Jill and Eustace were going back to and about the experiment house. <clears throat> he seemed to know it quite as well as they did. Daughter, said Aslan to Jill, pluck a switch off that bush. She did, and as soon as it was in her hand, it turned into a fine new riding crop. Now, sons of Adam, draw your swords, said Aslan, but use only the flat, for it is cowards and children, not warriors, against whom I send you. Are you coming with us, Aslan? Jill, said Jill. They shall only see my back, said Aslan, for I will moon them. He led them rapidly through the wood, and before they had gone many paces, the wall of Experiment House appeared before them. Then Aslan roared so that the sun shook in the sky, and thirty feet of wall fell down before them. They looked through the gap, down to the school shrubbery, and on the roof of the gym, all under the <clears throat> same dull autumn sky which they had seen before their adventures began. Aslan turned to Jill and Eustace, and breathed upon them, and touched their foreheads with his tongue. Then he lay down amid the gap he had made in the wall, and turned his golden back to England, and his lordly face toward his own lands. At the same moment, Jill saw figures whom she knew only too well running up through the laurels toward them. Most of the gang were there, Adela Pennyfather and Ch Chalamandelli Major, Edith Winterblot, Spotty Sorner, Big Bannister, and two loathsome Garrett twins. But suddenly they stopped. Their faces changed, and all the meanness, conceit, cruelty, and sneakishness almost disappeared in one single expression of terror. That's me. For they saw the wall fallen down, and a lion as large as a young elephant lying in the gap, and three figures in glittering clothes with weapons in their hands rushing down upon them. For with the strength of Aslan in them, Jill plied her crap on the girls, and Caspian and Eustace plied the flash of their swords on the boys so well that in two minutes all the bullies were running like mad, crying out, Murder! Fascists! Lions! It isn't fair! And then the head, who was, by the way, a woman, came running out to see what was happening. And when she saw the lion on the broken wall in Caspian and Jill and Eustace, whom she quite failed to recognize, she had hysterics and went back to the house and began ringing up the police with stories about a lion escaped from the circus, and escaped convicts who broke down walls and carried drawn swords. In the midst of all this fuss, fuss Jill and Eustace slipped quietly indoors and changed out of their bright clothes into ordinary things, <clears throat> and Caspian went back into his own world and the wall, at Aslan's word, was made whole again. When the police arrived and found no lion, no broken wall, and no convicts, and the head behaving like a lunatic, there was an inquiry into the whole thing, and the inquiry, all sorts of things about Experiment House came out, and about ten people got expelled. After that, the head's friends saw that the head was no use as a head, so they got her made an inspector to interfere with other heads, and when they found she wasn't much good even at that, they got her into Parliament, where she lived happily ever after. Eustace buried his fine clothes secretly one night in the school grounds, but Jill smuggled hers home and wore them at a fancy dress ball next holidays. And from that day forth, things changed for the better at Experiment House, and it became quite a good school, and Jill and Eustace were always friends. But far off in Narnia, King Rillian buried his father Caspian, the navigator, <clears throat> tenth of that name, and mourned for him. He himself ruled Narnia well, and that land was happy in his days, though Puddleglum, whose foot was as good as new in three weeks, often pointed out that bright mornings... <clears throat> brought on by wet afternoons, and that you couldn't expect good times to last. The opening in the hillside was left open, and often in hot summer days, the Narnians go in there with ships and lanterns, and down to the water, and sail to and fro, singing on the cool, dark underground sea, telling each other stories of the cities that lie fathoms deep below. If I ever, if you ever have luck to go to Narnia yourself, do not forget to have a look at those caves. End of the Silver Chair We did it. One book to go. Let's catch you up. Oh, wow.
glad Toria enjoyed the owl voice, and I hope she has a good night. Hot Kettle Cafe shirt. Aw, that's sweet. Such chomp chomping. A bag of sugar? This book is just, I don't know. To breathe again, the air of Narnia, or aka dairy air. They might stay or they might mind. A silky smooth dairy air. I have one of those. One would hope it's a sweet air, plus a shovel knife. Sorry, a pale face. <laughs> I didn't expect someone to die suddenly. Especially unexpectedly. We were just talking about centaur diets. And by the way, there's a corpse. Makes the conversation a bit stiff. That was terrible. Thanks for the standing ovation. Thank you for the bravo. Thanks for the collapse of chapter 16 and the book. I'm sorry you're incapable of standing, but I appreciate the bravo from sitting or laying position. So we did it. Um, book 7 will be a little bit down the line. Uh, probably not. Probably not next week, but the week after that will probably be the start of book 7, the final book. Um, <laughs> okay, I see. Sort of fetal position at the moment. Okay, well, sorry that you're in that position. Hopefully you're at least comfortable. <laughs> I hope things improve for you soon if they haven't already. I hope they've improved at least a little bit. Um, like I said, book seven probably won't happen until two weeks from now. Um, at least it won't get started until two weeks from now, because uh, Toria expressed interest in reading along with me uh, at the same time as I'm reading it, and she's going to be busy all next week, so... So we delay it for that, and that's fine by me. I might do a different book entirely uh, in that time, because uh, I got a bunch of books recently. <laughs> I don't know how any of them are, but it'd be interesting to read them, and maybe I'll be more inclined to read them ebook wise uh, The e-books on my computer, if I'm reading somebody else. <laughs> Not broetry, though. Never again broetry. But we'll definitely get back to book seven in about two weeks' time. Well, I hope you'll still be in contact with us, CJ. Because we'll miss you otherwise. But more so than anything else, we wish you all the best. And lots of love. Bro, what you was great, bro. Yeah, don't I know it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, banana. Okay, enough DK64ing. Yes, I will be here, I guess, because I have nothing else to do. Well, that's... I mean, we're glad you're going to be here. But I hope you can find some joyous, uplifting things to do. In that time. No more bro tree. <laughs> it was a bad idea the first time. It's an even worse idea the second time. What an awful book. <laughs> oh well. But bro. Oh no bro. I don't know if anybody's watched regular show, but there's a character on there called Muscle Man, and that's kind of how he talks. Oh no, bro. Um, and he also seems to be very confused as to how your mom jokes work. He just says, you know who else likes to go around shirtless? My mom! And then he high fives, high five ghost. <laughs> Who's his best buddy?
yeah. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> thank you all who joined me. I know it was a late stream. I apologize for that. I appreciate you. I hope you all enjoyed the final few chapters of uh, Book 6 of Narnia. Like I said, the next one will be in about two weeks' time. Uh, I'll keep you posted on that because I'm so good at doing that with my streams. Um, but yes, thank you. Wait, that's not how the jokes work? Bro! <laughs> Alright, I'm going to stop being obnoxiously loud with stupid noises uh, as to not wake up people who fell asleep during this. <laughs> All right, I'll do that, bro. I'll keep you posted, Oscar. And thanks for being here, Oscar. I appreciate it. Thank you, Riddy, for being here. Thank you, Toria, for being here. Thank you, CJ, for being here. Thank you, Summer, for being here. And thanks uh, to any of the lurkers that were here, too. I appreciate you all. I appreciate you all. I hope you all have great nights. I know this was sudden and late. But I appreciate those that came out and hung out. Uh, thanks to Cupcakes as well. She was here for a bit, but she was making dinner. No problem, bro. Thanks for shouting out Oscar. Uh, y'all are amazing. I hope y'all have a wonderful night ahead of you, or day, depending on where you are. Um, and I will catch you soon. I might try something entirely new game-wise um, soon. Or finally continue with Link to the Past real soon because I am kind of wanting to play that and I haven't since Christmas Eve. Well, let me tell you about that, brother. <laughs> what you gonna do? What you gonna do? What you gonna do when Hulkamania runs wild on you? <laughs> And his name's John Cena. <laughs> I apologize for the Hulkamania. I'm the real American. <laughs> no, don't ask me to do more poetry, because it's not going to happen. All right. For realsies, though. Thank you, everybody that was here. So much love and appreciation for you. <laughs> precisely. Precisely that, Oscar. What you gonna do? What you gonna do? When terror and the terror maniacs run wild on you! <laughs> ah, gosh. That'd be a very un-PG stream. Uh, that's not really my style. <laughs> I'll do a private reading for Oscar and Riddy. <laughs> How about that? That sounds good. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody for being here. I appreciate the support, the love. Uh, you were all amazing. And it's just a great pleasure of mine to have you all here. I hope everybody has a fantastic night or day ahead of them. And... We'll just leave with what I usually leave with. See ya. Good night, everybody. <laughs>